Welcome to Binfield Free Church. This Sunday morning, we can't um, be together physically, but we are still the Church of Jesus Christ. We're still the people he has died to save, the people he's calling from all the world to belong to him, to be his special possession, that we might worship him and that we might be freed from sin and that we might ultimately be with him in new heavens and the new earth. This Jesus who said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, even death itself, will not stand against it. This is the Jesus we come to this morning. We are his church, even though we are scattered physically, we are his church. And this is his word to us this morning. I'm just going to read one verse from Isaiah chapter one. This is what Jesus says to us, to his people and to anyone listening. If you're not yet one of his people, this word is especially to you this morning. Jesus, by the prophet Isaiah, says this, come now, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you invite us to come. You invite us to come as sinners and to see the salvation you have for us in the Lord Jesus. Father, we praise you that you sent your son. You sent him from heaven. You sent him to become a man, to live, to love, to be betrayed, to die, to be separated from you. You sent your son to those whom you'd chosen. That is, you sent your son to come and save your people out of the world. All who would come to you through him, all who would put their trust in him, you sent your son. And Jesus, we praise you that you came. You came in obedience, obedience to your father. You came in love for us lost sinners. You came to take our sin and to give us your righteousness. You came that as Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before, our sins like scarlet could be white as snow. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you lived and died for us and that we can come to your Father and our Father through your work. And Holy Spirit, we praise you that you have taken what Jesus has done and you've made it ours. You've joined us with Jesus. You've given us faith in him. You've made us one with him so that united with him, his perfect righteousness and goodness is ours. His merit, his, his right to be in heaven, and loved by the Father and, and loved by you, becomes ours. Father, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, we praise you for our great salvation. This salvation that was offered even to the people long before Jesus came physically, that we might come reason with you, that we might come settle matters with you, that our sins like scarlet might be white as snow. Father, help us all to come to you in this way, through the blood of Jesus, that our sins might be white as snow and that we might worship you truly as we are the people you are saving through what your son has done, that we might be that people and we might come to you as that people, even if we're not in one place, that we'd come to you and worship you this morning. Father, we pray that you'd speak to us as your word is read and as uh, Dabbeth preaches to us later um, and that you would bless us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to turn to... Isaiah chapter 1, again, have our main Bible reading that Dabbeth will be opening up for us a little later. Isaiah chapter 1, I'm going to read the whole chapter, so verse 1 down to verse uh, 31. Let's hear the word of the Lord. We are looking at the book of Isaiah today and for the next four Sundays after today as part of our Reading the Bible Together series. 
over three years reading through all the Bible and having opportunity to hear preaching on it and to discuss it in our in our prayer times to um, during the week and especially uh, the last Sunday of the month. So we're excited to start Isaiah. Isaiah, who was prophesying to a rebellious Israelite people who had turned away from God. And God had to announce that judgment was coming through Assyria and later through Babylon. And yet in the pictures of judgment, we see grace. And we see glimpses of the Lord Jesus Christ who hundreds of years later would come and truly save his people. Anyway, let's begin Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 1 reading to the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord to us. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they've rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation. Woe to a people whose guilt is great. A brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They've forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege, unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who's asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. They've become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her. And now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of, of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the mighty one of Israel declares, ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers, as at the beginning, afterwards, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness, but rebels and sinners will both be broken. And those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you've delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens you've chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder and his word a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. This is the word of the Lord. We pray that he will add his blessing as we hear his word and in a moment as we hear his word preached to us. Shall we worship God again now in prayer? Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we praise you that you are a God of justice. Your ancient people, Israel, in these verses were very far from you and your wrath was deserved and it was coming. But Father, it's just a picture of the wrath coming on the world in the end. Father, when every wrong must be accounted for but father we praise you for jesus we praise you that sheltering in him we do not need to fear that day they would have been pretty fearful 800 years before jesus of the assyrians and and then the babylonians but how much more fearful should we be of the last day the day of justice and judgment the day that is coming if we're outside of christ so father I pray for everyone joining us this morning. Father, might we take our shelter in Christ. Might we come and reason with you. Might we come and bring a, a conclusion to the matter as your word has just encouraged us to do, that our sins might be taken away. And Father, we thank you that we have the church that you are building. Father, we thank you that we have one another. Even though we can't be together, Father, we thank you that we are still the church. Thank you that we can encourage one another, that we can pray together using things like Zoom and these amazing mechanisms that we wouldn't have even had 10 or 20 years ago that you give us, that we can keep in touch, we can message, we can call, we can gather on Zoom to pray and study your word together. We can use YouTube as we are doing now 
that your word can be preached and can be heard and can be obeyed. Father, we thank you for these things and we pray that you might use them uh, in ways that we don't, perhaps don't know about, but we will know about on the last day, that you might save sinners. Father, even that people listening to this message, maybe who we don't normally see on a Sunday, Father, that they would nevertheless come to you through Jesus. Father, we pray that you would bless all that we do. We pray that you'd build us up as a church and Father, that no one might be left out or left behind. Father, I pray that we, your people in Binfield, would be better and better but looking out for one another and sending encouragements to one another at helping one another that we might be more and more the people of the Lord Jesus even during our lockdown. Father we pray to for um, rulers and those in authority as your word encourages us to pray. We thank you for the good news that our Prime Minister um, and his fiance have, have had um, a safe arrival of the baby um, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name, I get names wrong, but Father, you know, and you know, um, you know the precious value of every soul. We pray for that family, for that new life. We pray for our Prime Minister, Father, that you would put justice in his heart, that he would make wise decisions, that when it's the right time, he might lead us to end the lockdown. Father, we long to be able to gather as the church and to do evangelism and to have fellowship with one another and to go about our lives Father, and serve and, and live for you. We pray that our Prime Minister would know the right time. But more than that, Father, we pray that you would make him righteous before you, that you would give him trust in the Lord Jesus, that he would truly lead us as one who knows his God. And Father, we pray the same for the other politicians, members of the Conservative Party and the opposition parties. Father, we pray that there might be righteousness among our politicians. Um, and Father, we would not want to be hypocritical, though. We pray now that there would be righteousness in our lives. Father, we pray you'd make each of us holy. Sin is such a big deal. Sin is not just naughty things that we do or say or think. It's rebellion against you in our hearts. And Father, we pray, show us our sin. Show us the Saviour. Break us in our stubbornness. Father, if any of us are resisting you, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come, melt our hearts, show us your love for us in Jesus, show us all that he's done for us, show us how you've loved us eternally. Father, that we'd break down before you, we'd submit to you, we would have Jesus as our Lord and as our saviour, as our very best friend. Father, we pray that for ourselves. I pray that for everyone listening, for everyone in, among our fellowship. Father, break us in our sin and our stubbornness that we might be wholly yours. And Father, we pray that, especially now as Davith brings your word to us. Father, we pray, would you speak to us? Let his words not just be his words, but would, would he open the passage for us? But Father, your word tells us it's really it's the soil that matters most. Would we be good soil, soil that receives the word of Christ, soil where there is a harvest, where your word goes in deep, where it changes things, where it grows, and eventually there's a harvest of righteousness that we might trust Jesus and trust him all our lives and live for him righteously. righteously. Father, we pray, please speak to us now. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And I will hand over now to Davith to bring God's word to us from Isaiah. Thank you. Well, hello and good morning. It is such a privilege to be able to preach God's Word to you this morning. And if you do have a copy of God's Word, if you do have a Bible, will you please turn to the book of Isaiah and chapter 1, which was read for us earlier. Now, apart from the Psalms, Isaiah is the largest book in the Bible. It's got 66 chapters. Just as the Bible's got 66 books in it, so that's easy to remember. And it's often been described as the fifth gospel. 
because we've got so many familiar verses in the book of Isaiah, haven't we? The prophet Isaiah is quoted or referred to some 85 times in the New Testament. And the book of Isaiah is often preached from at Christmas time and Easter, isn't it? And I think it's very significant that the name Isaiah means Jehovah is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. And salvation is the great theme of the book of Isaiah, perhaps more than any other prophet. So, when did Isaiah prophesy? Well, the prophet was preaching around 200 years before David was king and around 700 years before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Now, to bring us up to speed with a history, Israel had crossed the River Jordan into the land of Canaan and they'd lived there for about 360 years before Saul had become king. Now Saul was king of Israel for 40 years, David was king of Israel for 40 years and Solomon was king of Israel for 40 years. So those 120 years were probably the most prosperous and peaceful years in Israel's history. Israel was a united kingdom. But after the death of Solomon, there was a civil war and the kingdom was divided. Israel was a divided kingdom. You had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Judah in the south was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, with Jerusalem as the capital. And you had Israel in the north, made up of the other ten tribes, and Samaria was the capital there. Now, during the divided kingdom, Israel had 19 kings, and all of them were bad, 19 bad kings in Israel in the north. And during the divided kingdom, Judah had 20 kings. Judah in the south had 20 kings, and only eight of them were good. Now, the prophet Isaiah was preaching to the people in the south, Judah in the south, under the reign of of four kings and we see their names in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 if you have a look at that chapter 1 and verse 1 the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah who was a good king Jotham who was another good king Ahaz who was a bad king and Hezekiah, who was a good king, and they were the kings of Judah during Isaiah's ministry. Now, chronologically, the book actually starts in chapter 6 with Isaiah's commission. So the first five chapters happen later in Isaiah's ministry. So you could say the book of Isaiah begins like one of those dramas or films the start actually halfway through the story, just to put this in the picture. So Isaiah chapter 1 to 5 set the scene, as it were. The first five chapters give us a sense of the circumstances that Isaiah faced and the kind of message he would preach throughout his whole ministry. Now, our main text for this morning's message comes from verse 18, that great gospel text of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. But leading up to that verse, we have a heartbreaking description of Judah's rebellion and sin, don't we? Let's begin with verses 2 and 3. What do we read there? Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. 
Now, Isaiah describes Judah as being worse than animals. The Lord describes Judah as being worse than animals, as ignorant or more ignorant than animals. But what about verse 4 then? Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Now Judah are described as the Lord's children. But we read of them actually spurning the Lord. What does it mean to spurn someone? It means to despise them. Judah now despise the Lord. Now there's nothing sadder, is there, than children who hate their own parents. That's kind of what's going on here with Judah. Well, what about the first half of verse 5 then? What do we read there? Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Here, we're given the impression that Judah have been disciplined by the Lord. Yet they still refuse to repent and trust in the Lord. In spite of being lovingly disciplined, they still don't repent and turn to the Lord. Let's have a look at the second half of verse 5 and the whole of verse 6 then. Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. What a horrific and graphic description of Judah's sin. Judah was spiritually sick and they desperately needed help, didn't they? And that's what happens when people turn their backs on the Lord and turn to sin. They effectively hurt themselves. It is the most dangerous thing in the world to do, to turn your back on the Lord and to turn to sin. And then if we move on to verses 9 and 10, what do we read there? Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Judah had become as vile as infamous Sodom and Gomorrah. Now this is probably one of the biggest insults you could give someone to describe them as Sodom and Gomorrah. Even in popular culture today, Sodom and Gomorrah are considered as places of great immorality. The immorality of Judah was so great. And the only reason the Lord didn't destroy Judah with fire and brimstone, just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, was because there was a small remnant of faithful believers still left in Judah. What do we read then in verses 11 to 15? The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fat and animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon Sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals. 
I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Even Judah's religious services were an abomination to the Lord. Even something that they thought they were best at was detestable to the Lord. Their religion was just a cover-up, wasn't it? Their religion was just like a rug or a mat that you put over a bad stain on a carpet. Things may look perfect and good on the surface, but what's underneath the, st the surface? What is causing that sort of stench? And now the Lord always looks under the surface, doesn't he? The Lord always asks the question, what's your heart like? Are you really loving me? Are you really serving me? Are you really loving and serving your neighbour? Do we sometimes use church or spirituality as a cover-up? Now, if you know the, the language, spirituality can be one of the easiest things in the world to fake, can't it? Now, let's have a look at the prophet's conclusion before we have a look at verse 18. What do we read there? In verses 16 and 17. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Now, when we see this passage, are religious people just faking it? When we see this passage, what do we see? We see religious Judah who think that they're right with God. But the truth is, Judah are dirty, vile, wicked people who need to be made clean who need to repent of their sin, who need to turn away from their sin. And then in verses 18 to 20, uh, these words come out of the mouth of the Lord himself. What do we read there? Isaiah 1, verses 18 to 20. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you were willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now in verse 18, the Lord invites Judah to come to him for cleansing, the cleansing they so desperately needed. Now, I believe that the people of Judah 2,700 years ago aren't too dissimilar to the people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain today. Now, according to the last uh, census of England and Wales in 2011, Christianity was the largest religion, with 33.2 million people professing to be Christian. That is 59.3% of the population. That's almost two out of three people in England and Wales claim to be Christians, claimed to belong to Christ. I wonder, do two out of three people actually know Jesus and love Jesus in England and Wales today? What do you think? Well, I don't think so. 
I'm not sure. Apparently, only 2 to 3% of the population actually go to a Bible believing church in England and Wales. As a nation, we have rebelled against the Lord. As a nation, we have sinned against the Lord. As a nation, we have turned our backs on the Lord. As a nation, we are spiritually sick in our sin. And I think as a nation, we are good at using religion and good works to try and cover up our sins. But the Lord is not conned by us, is he? As a nation, we are dirty, vile, wicked people who need to be made clean of our sins. But just like Judah 2,700 years ago, the Lord invites us to come to him today for the cleansing that we so desperately need. So let's have a look at this glorious invitation that the Lord gives, inviting us to come to him. What do we read again in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18? It begins with, come, come. And the first point I'd like to make is that this invitation is personal. The Lord says, come. The Lord says, come to me. The Lord doesn't say, go, does he? He says, come. The Lord doesn't say, go there or go to that person. He says, no, come to me. Now, in spite of the way Judah had treated the Lord, he invited them to come to him. And this same invitation is given to the world today. We are given an invitation to come to Jesus in spite of the way we've treated him. How have we treated Jesus? Well, it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin that caused Jesus to be forsaken. It was my sin that caused Jesus to be abandoned. It was my sin that beat Jesus. It was my sin that mocked Jesus. It was my sin that spat upon Jesus. It was my sin that scourged Jesus' back. It was my sins that pushed that crown of thorns into his head. It was my sins that pierced his hands and his feet. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ as he calls his people to come to him. What do we read in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28? The Lord inviting people to come to him. Matthew's gospel, the 11th chapter and the 28th verse. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And what do we read in John's Gospel and the seventh chapter, John chapter 7? Again, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. John chapter 7. And this is 37 and 38. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And what do we read in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, an invitation to come again. Some of the last words of the whole Bible, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, what do we read there? The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. It's an invitation, isn't it, the Lord gives, an invitation to come home, 
to come to home to him, to come to the place where we belong. Now there's a story about uh, a woman who lived in a shanty town outside uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She's a very poor woman, very poor, but she had a very beautiful daughter. And this woman's greatest fear was that she knew that one day her daughter would leave the home and go to the city, go to Rio de Janeiro to try and make a better life for herself. But the woman knew what would happen to her beautiful daughter if she went to Rio de Janeiro. Well, one day the woman came home and her daughter was gone. And there was a note on the table that said, I've gone to Rio to find a better life. And the mother knew what would happen to her. So she took all the money that she had and she bought a bus ticket and off she went to Rio de Janeiro. And she went into a little photo shop and she spent a great deal of money just printing out pictures of herself. And the mother spent months in Rio. She looked in every hotel for her daughter, every restaurant, every nightclub, and everywhere she went, she left a picture of her own face. Well, finally, the mother ran out of money and she had to go home, back to the shanty town outside Rio. Now, one night, the daughter was coming down the stairs of a hotel. She was with a man. She'd become a prostitute. She looked as if she'd aged about 15 years. And as she was coming down the stairs, she felt as if she was going to die. And she looks in a mirror and she sees how she's aged. She sees the scars on her. But something catches her eye. She sees a picture of her mother. Her mother. She grabs the picture and she can't believe it. And she turns it over and on the back she reads, I don't care what you've become and I don't care what you've done. Please come home. Please come home. And this morning, the Lord is saying to a lost and dying world, I don't care what you've become. I don't care what you've done. I paid for it all with my blood on the cross. Now come home. This invitation is a personal invitation. And secondly, we see that we are to respond to this invitation immediately. What do we read again in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18? Come now. Come now. Now, most invitations have got an RSVP date. A date when we should respond to say whether we're going to come or not. Well, Jesus has an RSVP date for his invitation to come to him. Jesus' RSVP date is today. It is now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that now is the appointed time. The devil's motto is tomorrow. Uh, there's an illustration about uh, the demons trying to devise a plan on how to stop people from becoming Christians. And one of the demons says, oh, let's tell the world that God doesn't exist. And the devil says, no, well, that's not going to work. Everyone knows deep down that God exists. And there's so much evidence for the existence of God. Another demon says, oh, let's tell the world that the Bible isn't true. And the devil says, oh, that's not going to work either. Anyone who reads the Bible with any integrity will come to see that the Bible is true. And there's so much evidence that the Bible's true as well. And then the devil says, let's keep telling people that they can become a Christian, but they've got plenty of time to do it. Let's tell people that they can become a Christian tomorrow. And then the world will keep putting it off 
the world will keep putting off becoming a Christian until one day it will be too late. We're to respond to the invitation to come to Jesus immediately. And then thirdly, we see the kindness of this invitation. Thirdly and lastly, we see the kindness of this invitation. What do we read in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18? Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, when the Bible says, come now, let us settle the matter, this doesn't mean that the Lord wants to meet sort of halfway. This doesn't mean that the Lord is willing to, to compromise or anything like that. When the Bible says, let us settle the matter, you get an image of like an out of court settlement. It means an out of court settlement. Now people usually do an out of court settlement because they're afraid that they're gonna lose. Now, the Lord isn't offering to do an out-of-court settlement with us because he's afraid that he's going to lose. No, the Lord wants to do an out-of-court settlement with us because he knows that we are going to lose. It's almost as if the Lord is kindly and graciously telling us, look, let's settle this out-of-court because you really don't want to go to court with me because you're going to lose because the Lord is the judge the Lord is the jury and the Lord is the executioner now some people reject an out of court settlement don't they they say I'll, I'll take my chances in court you don't want to take your chances in court with the Lord I've even heard some people say, well, I hope there is a judgment day. I hope there is a day when I'll stand before God so I can tell him what I think. And judgment day won't be like that. Judgment day won't be an opportunity for us to answer back to the Lord. Judgment day will be a terrifying day for the unbeliever. Every tongue will be silenced. The Lord God gives us a kind invitation. But I think it's also so important to note how good this invitation is. Fourthly, we see how good this invitation is. What do we read? Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, the Lord's promise to Judah is the same promise as he gives the world today. Come to me and I will wash away all your sins. Uh, verse 15 tells us that uh, Judah's hands were stained with blood. They were dirty and unclean in the sight of the Lord. But if anyone would come to the Lord and accept his invitation... He will make them completely clean from the inside out. Now, apparently the words uh, scarlet and crimson refer to a dye that was extracted from shellfish and a certain type of insect, apparently. And uh, when white garments were dyed with these colours, they could never be made white again. Once they were dyed, no human effort could ever make them white again. Now the law describes our sin. The law describes the sins of Judah like clothes stained with scarlet and crimson. Nothing that Judah did could ever, ever take away that stain. Now uh, in ancient times, once a garment was stained, it could never be made white and perfect again. 
But if Judah would just come to the Lord in faith and repentance of their sins, he had the power to make them whiter than snow, as pure as wool. Now only the Lord could take the stain of their sin away and make them clean again. We can't make ourselves clean by our religious deeds or good works. Now some people say, well I've done more good than bad. Well, that is a good thing. But one bad thing, just one bad thing, is enough to keep us out of heaven. One sin is enough to separate us from God. It's a bit like a, an MOT check on a car. I think there are 14 checks uh, to do uh, when a car is being MOT'd. And if a car passed 13 of the checks, but failed on one of them, the car has still failed the MOT. Even if we've only committed one sin in our life, we've still failed. We've still fallen short of God's glory. We're still sinners. We're still separated from God. We still deserve to be punished for our sins. And when we try to get rid of our own sins with our own efforts, what do we do? All we do is make the stain deeper, isn't it? What does the Bible say in 1 John chapter 1 verse 7? The Bible says that the blood of Jesus, his son, God's son, purifies us or cleanses us from all sin. This is such a good invitation, isn't it? It's a miraculous and good invitation. Now, I remember the day. I remember the day when the Lord invited me to come to him. He promised me that he would wash away my sins. And his invitation was so good, I just had to come. I came to Jesus by faith. And I'm saved today, not because I'm a good person, but because God is good. Today I have a relationship with God the Father through God the Son. Today God the Holy Spirit lives in me through faith in Jesus Christ. My past, present and future sins have been washed away by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And today I am whiter than snow. My sins are forgiven today and I have eternal life. If you have never come to Jesus, or if it's been a while since you've come to Jesus, will you come to Jesus in faith and repentance of your sins today? But you might be saying, well, what if I don't come? What if I reject Jesus' invitation to come to him, to have my sins washed away? And what do we read again in verse 19? If you are willing and obedient, as willing and obedient to come to Jesus, you will eat the good things of the land. That's a description of enjoying the glory of the new creation forever and ever. Then look at verse 20. This is the consequence of rejecting Jesus' invitation. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And may God bless the word that he has spoken. And may he be merciful and gracious to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.